I'm Peter Levine, the director of the Defense Management Institute, and we're here today as a part of a planned series of interviews of individuals who have made significant contributions to improving the management of the Department of Defense. Today, we're speaking with Robert Rangel, who served as Chief of Staff to Secretaries of Defense Robert Gates and Donald Rumsfeld, and as Staff Director of the House Armed Services Committee before taking an industry position from which he recently retired. There is some truth to um, whether it should be this way or not. I think it's just the reality yeah. that there's there's a, a degree of uh, resistance, institutional, bureaucratic, call it what you will, that is almost impossible to overcome for an institution like the Department of Defense to reform itself on fundamental reforms. And so I don't think theoretic, theoretically there's nothing stopping it, but in a practical sense, mm -hmm. that may be the case. Looking at it through the lens of the Congress, uh, particularly as now we can talk about what transpired, years of efforts of reform by the Congress on various aspects of the department. Um, I think what's not well understood that much anymore is Goldwater Nichols was a multi-year process. It began with um, it began with determination by certain key members to look at a variety of different things. It accelerated, but it, it really fermented over a course of almost four years. I mean, the, the culmination of the act that we know of, the 1996 act, really began earlier than that. You can cite Grenada, you can cite Beirut, you can cite a lot of seminal events that sort of gave uh, momentum to it. You had the Packard Commission, there was a whole variety of different animating factors and events that, that culminated ultimately. But um, that fermentation process, I think, was ultimately what made this one of the more significant and it has withstood the test of time. It's not to mean it was perfect. It continued to be refined and mm -hmm. changed over a decade, really. Uh, but fundamentally, if you look at the structural changes and, uh, that, that emerged from that, they have withstood this, the test of time. And I think that's a tribute to um, the commitment and the effort and the patience, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, to let it evolve for a period of time as opposed to dropping a bill, ramming it through. First is personal commitment. Uh, in other words, many prior efforts and, and sort of the standard playbook that the department uses for such reviews, whether it's programmatic, organizational, or whatever is, you know, it can even be chartered by the Secretary of Defense, but you, you put a team together, you put a task force, whatever the mechanism is, you give them a general sense of direction, here's what you're expecting, and then they go off and do it and they bring you back a product. Um, he recognized that that would yield an outcome, but it would not yield the, it would not yield the ambition, number one, that he felt was necessary. So he made this a very focused and personal issue, uh, initiative. Uh, he kept it within the immediate office of the secretary. Secondly, he ensured that the key stakeholders, the service chiefs, the service secretaries, had a role, had transparency and visibility, even though at the end of the day, there was a lot of disagreement. And thirdly, uh, you mentioned the uh, decision to disestablish certain organizations. Um, he, he did something fairly unconventional. He sort of front-loaded that. Uh, even though there was, the way it was structured, there was still an ability to do the analysis and essentially come back and move and shape, reshape it. But he, he mandated, and I'll explain why, the disestablishment of three organizational uh, entities. Uh, defense agency, uh, an OSD secretariat, and uh, a combatant command. And his intent behind that was, I mean, the macro of all this was to essentially harvest savings, harvest cost savings, particularly in the out years, 
that could be redirected in um, <clears throat> and basically backfill some of the reductions that he knew were coming by the new Obama administration. That was the grand bargain that he tried to strike with with uh, the services and, and the organization. And Title 10 makes it very clear. Authority, direction, and control comes from a singular individual, the Secretary of Defense. Everything else is secondary. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges, particularly as you look at the OSD structure and the services sort of play in this as well, um, is those power relationships, those authority relationships are com complex, they're complicated, they're very dynamic, they're driven by personalities, but at the core is this question of there's undisputable truth that at the end of the day, the Secretary of Defense hold that singular that statutory responsibility and authority, where it gets fuzzier and then contentious is as it devolves down several layers. So when you inject another layer or another actor in that structure, it it's dynamic, it's fluid. Um, that's what my view was. At the end of the day, that's the classic role of the deputy. And yes, the deputy was designated CMO, but it's not enough just to have that title or appended to the charter. A deputy has to embrace it. A deputy has to understand it and has to live it operationally. Um, you can create support structures like you know, business transformation agencies, whatever it is. But at the core is, um, it's not just the day-to-day -day grinding through the administrative processes. It's the ability and the willingness and the drive to take on hard issues, mm -hmm. hard, difficult management issues, which the department, I think, has struggled to do. That it's, it's, a, it's a perilous proposition to essentially look to management reforms to automatically yield or even successfully yield. And that shouldn't be the, the prime purpose, because uh, quite honestly, there are so many other aspects that should drive management reforms in terms of just uh, you know, speed of decision, speed of action. And, you know, what are, the, what are the challenges that a department or an institution as large as a department faces? It's expensive, it's cumbersome, some would say even wasteful. But that's just a one dimension of it, and at the core, that's you know, what's its mission? What, what is impeding the ability to deliver for the country the core mission? It's mm -hmm. not just yeah, the, the cost, even though I don't want to downplay that, that that's important. We can, we can cite singular examples of mm -hmm. uh, successful uh, exercises or uh, instances like that, just like we can cite disastrous ones. But as a as a fundamental proposition, I there is value in that private sector experience, but if it is not um, if it is not grounded or tempered or um, joined with an understanding of the culture, the environment, uh, government is political. Mm -hmm. Not in a big P partisan, but in a small P. It's, it's, it, uh, there are so many factors and dynamics that shape and drive and behavior and uh, et cetera. And the private sector experience brings new toolkits, tool sets that you can bring uh, and practices and so forth. We have to leaven them and, and, and mix them in a productive fashion with, with a healthy understanding of the culture of the institution and what, a, what animates government. Some of the more successful, I suppose, instances of um, managing that dynamic and, and the integration, really, of the sort of the DOD as an enterprise, you, you trace back to leadership and individuals, as, as trite as that sounds. I don't think you, you can tinker, and Goldwater Nichols did some of that, and over the years, Congress has tried to do some of that, particularly on the acquisition side. Um, 
But at the core, that's why who you pick. Um, I mean, I remember early Rumsfeld. You know, he, he saw sort of this corporate board team and you know, spent a lot of effort. And he'd come up and I'm sure he talked to the Senate like he talked to the House. His, his vision and this and that. It didn't work. Um, just the centrifugal force of the institutional force just creates the, such such barriers. Um, but there's no substitute for having somebody at the helm that understands that role. Part of it is communication as well. Uh, it's it's very easy. You get into you get into the department. You know the daily challenges. What comes at you fast and furious drives you in a particular direction. Um, one of the things I tried to do in the position that I had was just to push and drive routine interaction, uh, communication, uh, to synchronize as much as possible. Better. What animates you? What drives you to keep at it and keep you motivated, keep you focused, keep you energized? At the core, that has to be there. It has to burn bright in you. And remind yourself of that. Six months in, you know, your inbox is overflowing and people are screaming at you and the Hill wants you to come testify and whatever. Why are you there? 